So should we, uh, why, don't we why don't we get started? And uh, thank you all for coming today to uh, on this beautiful day. Uh, I'm, I'm half inclined to say, can we fold it outside? Uh, but uh, we do have uh, technology we can't easily take outside, so I guess we can't do. That. But it is my uh, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, to welcome Yufu uh, Dabkara, who is here as a fellow in the Humanities Institute is under the auspices of the Humility and Conviction in Public Life Project. And uh, it's been a real pleasure having Hoot here because of uh, the immense amount of intellectual energy he's put in uh, just in the last couple months into the project. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited about uh, what he's going to talk about today. Uh, but let me give you a little bit of his background. Um, so he is uh, completing his postgraduate studies um, in the program in Islamic Theology at the University of Paderborn. Uh, he has previously been a visiting scholar at the UCLA Law School. Uh, he's been a Fulbright Scholar in History and a teaching fellow at Harvard, and uh, has been a researcher at the United States Holocaust Memorial uh, Museum, and has uh, uh, a significant and impressive list of publications already in his career, uh, to which uh, I think he'll be adding some more uh, coming out of this project that he's going to talk about today, um, which is Wounded Certainty. So without further ado, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. Very happy to be here. I'm sorry I had a cold and cutting off just um, I grabbed the napkins. Um, you know, when I started pre preparing for this presentation, and haven't actually quite been, um, in the past two, I was always reminded of this work. I don't know whether you guys have come across the complete works of William Shakespeare, but I mean, it started off in England, and then it swept over to Berlin, my hometown. Uh, you know, incredible success, 20 years now, on stage, always sold out, a daring attempt to show all of Shakespeare in 90 minutes, right? And they, they managed to do it. It's fantastic, it's really hilarious. And that's how I feel. When I go through my topic, it feels like I'm going through an entire oeuvre of uh, someone who has written you know, multiple books. But I have um, certain disadvantages. First of all, I have only 45 months. <laughs> and second of all, you're more likely to know something about Shakespeare than about Middle Eastern or Muslim history, or even the works they have been written. Um, and that is also true for a Muslim only audience. We are not uh, the only ones who struggle with it. Um, let me get started. You might have come across the title already, more than certainly. I hope it's going to be clear by the end what I mean by that. And um, I want to start with a breakdown of what I'm, I'm going to talk to you about. Um, it's basically you know, divided up into three parts. I am first going to talk about the relationship between theology and philosophy. I will try to sort of define and um, explain what I see in those two entities and how they interrelate to one another. Um, and then I want to give a historical account of what I render as uh, philosophical theology in Islam. Um, and finally, I want to show how a philosophical theology in Islam can be implemented in contemporary contexts. So what I try to do is tackle um, the representatives of modern philosophy and do essentially what actually Muslim theologians did in the past, learn from, right? engage with and incorporate it into their theologies to the point where it becomes mainstream of Islamic faith. And I'm going to do that, I'm going to glance over Nietzsche, the German philosopher, and then I'm going to spend a little more time with under Camus, the French philosopher. And the reason why I chose Nietzsche and Camus is because they are somewhat interrelated to one another, and uh, they represent a specific type of philosophy that I find very appealing to engage with. Let me start with this picture, um, drawn by my brother, by the way. He is talented with that kind of stuff. I tried, but I feel all the time, so I asked him, and he looked that up in 10 minutes. Um, it's a metaphor that goes back to Kant, the German philosopher, who was trying to explain what reason means. And he said, reason is like a small, ch small child that always asks, what is behind the wall? Although you try to explain to him, you know, it might be this, it might be that, Essentially, it's of speculative nature. You cannot. So you try to lure the child to check out what is actually in front of him, in front of the wall. 
right? This is what you see, you can experience it, you can taste it, you can go ahead and touch it. But reason will always ask what's behind the wall, right? And Kant uses that metaphor to say you have to draw a line, basically, that's the wall. So there is part of our understanding that we cannot fully grasp with the faculties that are given to us, with basically the way how reason works. We're not capable to fully look behind the wall, and that's why we need to draw that line and focus on what's behind, a bit what's in front of the wall, basically, and that's what he describes as philosophy. And what goes beyond the wall is basically for him theology. That's an area that you can speculate about, and the idea that you can see some clouds up there resembles the notion that you may be able to sense certain things, but you do not have the same sense of clarity as you do with the things right in front of the wall. Right? So that's basically the relationship. And theology takes on that concept by basically doing this. So in this picture, you have two girls. And one girl is uh, lurking behind the wall. And she's getting assistance from the other girl, which in that case is philosophy. So theology takes on philosophy and looks behind the wall and tries to understand what is behind the wall. But as you can see in this picture too, theology is very much dependent on philosophy to look behind the wall. So you can't just basically do it by itself. It needs to understand the human condition. It needs to understand the human experience entirely and fully. Right? And that is a point where philosophy has its expertise. So in order to understand what theology is about, you need to start with philosophy and then you move on. You move on to a sphere that Aristotle is already defined as, you know, in his division of the sciences, theology is the part that's speculative in nature and it doesn't impact someone's life. That's how uh, Aristotle defines it. So he says, in contrast to basically what we do in ethics and politics, that is impacting and reflecting on our lives. But what we do in theology, thinking and reasoning about a divine entity, doesn't necessarily have an impact on our lives. It's purely speculative in nature. The challenges that lie ahead when you look at the relationship between theology and philosophy are actually twofold. There's an internal tension and there is an external tension. The internal tension is within the history of Muslim faith, there has been developments, very different developments, in which uh, philosophical theology at some point was pretty much in the center of the debate. And that was what we call the golden age of Islamic history in the Middle Ages, basically. It's, you know, it's difficult to say it stopped right there, but by and large, you would say from, you know, the 8th century to 14th century. That was the peak where Muslim uh, theologians, philosophers, translated large amounts of Greek philosophy first into Syriac and then from Syriac into Arabic. And not only just incorporated in terms of like, copy-paste, but they really engaged with it, right? In the case of Greek philosophy, that was quite appealing because the Greeks had an idea of what they called metaphysics. So the realm that goes beyond the physical world, basically that goes beyond the wall, right? So they had an idea of being, they had an idea of the divine, and they talked about it. They pretty much preferred not to speculate too much about it. They pretty much were more focused on the human relations and the human experience, but nevertheless, there was something where theology could be quantum, right, and employed. And it was a very fruitful relationship. So if uh, you look, for instance, on one scholar and one theologian I worked with, basically takes up my dissertation, he has incorporated large amounts of Aristotelian philosophy into his ethics, large amounts of Platonic theology, and he did sort of a fusion of both. Very interestingly that he actually, you know, Aristotle was a scholar, a student of Plato, and he disagreed with his master on many issues, and Miskaway and others in his time tried to basically um, look at those debates the two of them had, and became somewhat mediators, and created a new philosophy and incorporated that simultaneously into Islamic theology that 200 years after his death, a lot of Muslim theologians would just take up Miskaway and say he's the father of Muslim ethics, not knowing that basically 95% of what he sold as Muslim ethics was Greek philosophy. So it really became sort of the fabric of Muslim thinking in, by time. And then we have a development that sort of um, changes everything with modernity, and it almost goes, I would say, as far as to say it's upside down. In these days, Islamic philosophical theology is at the margins. 
I mean, it continues, but it continues on a very low profile. Only very few people in the academia, if anywhere, are actually aware of a concept like philosophical theology in the Muslim faith. It definitely doesn't impact any more sort of the lives of people. It doesn't reach out to the point where people would relate to works of Muslim uh, theologians who deal with philosophy. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you would ask around, no one would even be able to come up with someone who genuinely does Islamic philosophical theology. Right? They would always come up with ideas of the past, if ever. So it almost, you know, it's not only on the margins, but one could also say it's dead. It's not a debate that exists anymore. But it was in the middle of um, the, you know, sort of the center of uh, the intellectual debate back in the day. When I try to frame what theology is about, uh, one point I want to make sure that we understand is theology attempts to understand and explain a metaphysical occurrence. So in, in the Muslim faith, it's the Quranic revelation, what we translate to the divine speech. And maybe here you can see in the speculative nature, right? How can you prove to someone that the Quran is divine in nature? Proof, as in, you know, a philosophical proof that is based on arguments that can be checked and understood by reason, is not possible. That's what Kant says. You cannot prove whether God exists or not. You will not be able to do it because reason doesn't operate that way. You cannot go so far and say that God exists because of, you know, philosophical inquiry. That just doesn't work. So theology, but looks at this issue, so it touches a realm that doesn't necessarily belong to, you know, front of the wall. If I may go back to that picture, the initial impetus for theology, for the inquiry, actually stems from and is directed towards the divine, right? So the initial impetus is not to ask yourself, how can I improve my life, or how can I actually strive for happiness in my life. The initial impetus is an experience with the divine. And it starts the inquiry right there, and it closes. It's a full circle where you go back to the divine. Right? So you direct yourself to the divine, um, and it's, it starts with the divine. But that whole process of comprehension implies that the human faculties are required to lead the inquiry. I cannot do this inquiry with anything else but what is given to me, what we call reason, what we call the faculty of reason what we call you know, the, our mind and the way how we process information uh, and how we intellectualize things. So that's uh, the only thing that is given to me that's given to everyone, and I can't use anything but that, which also means at the same time, I cannot use this against its own design, right? So the main philosophical change that occurred, so I'm coming from a German school of philosophy, <laughs> it's Kant. I have to make sure that I mention Kant at least three times in my presentation. That's one of the requirements. I think I've had two so far now. So um, Kant is the you know the single most important philosopher in the German school. What he does is basically he changes the entire paradigm of thinking about philosophy. Up to his point, he says basically it's still a debate whether it's Plato or Aristotle, in one way or the other. Right? It's the metaphysical debate. We were never going to decide whether we need to look inside, platonically, and find the ideas that we need in order to reach happiness or whether we need to study the empirical uh, human experience in order to reach happiness. So those are the two, if you want to say, extremes that are defining what philosophy is. And Kant basically says, I'm breaking it down, you know what, we need to change that. We need to look at the faculty of reason and how reason operates if you want to understand how we understand the reality. Right? So he believes that reason is a faculty that has sort of a manual that operates on, on certain premises. And that is true for everyone. So that's, that's why we can call ourselves humanity or mankind. So there's no differentiation between anyone. Reason works just one way. Either something is unreasonable or it is reasonable. There's so nothing in between, basically. And by that, he totally changes everything upside down. So when I look back at the branches of theology, and I'm jumping back and forth, I'm trying to like create the uh, storyline. So when I look at the branches of Islamic theology again, and this is an historical account, so I, you know, looking back what happened in the time in the intellectual history of, uh, of Islam, and you see three different branches that emerged throughout time. I call them juridical theology, philosophical theology, and Sufism. Those are the three branches in which theology is being developed. Either it is done by the 
a juristic method and a juridical school. They have a hermeneutics, they have a certain understanding of how epistemology is being carried out. Uh, they, for instance, do not necessarily look at philosophical works, right? But you also should understand that these sort of branches overlap. And of course, they have a, you know, parts and selections where they actually talk about similar things. You have philosophic theology that pretty much concentrates and focuses on philosophical ideas and incorporates them into theological thinking. And then you have the mysticism or the Sufism. Right? The interesting and important part in this context is no institutional or epistemological hierarchy. So all three branches are basically equally authentic and equally uh, potent to talk about theology, right? So it's important because in comparison to Christianity, you have, for instance, you know, a church and institution that decides what's, what, what Christianity is about, whether it's Catholic or not. In, in the case of the Muslim world, you do not have that. You do not have a single authority that could claim to represent the teachings or the authentic teachings. So what you have is a plurality of opinions, and it can be very difficult to maneuver through these opinions, right? However, at the same time, this doesn't mean it's like sort of relativism. So there is always a normative claim, right? Um, it doesn't mean that it's sort of, you know, you can choose and pick what you want and basically live by it. Everyone who engages in one of those branches does pay attention to a certain epistemological idea, to a certain normativity that is being carried out. So it's not just like, you know, I feel this way and I'm acting this way. You do have to argue, you do have to convince people from what you believe. But at the same time, there is no such category as orthodoxy or conservatism or liberalism. I mean, people use those categories. Of course, Muslims use those categories, right? Muslims say, I'm an orthodox Muslim, I'm a conservative Muslim. But it doesn't make sense given the sort of division of sciences within Islam. So everyone has the same level of authenticity, can claim the same level of authenticity, and no one can basically say, I'm in hierarchy above you and I can tell you what your actual religious teachings are and what not. Yeah? And the main, that's uh, beautifully done by a Muslim scholar here in the United States, UCLA Khalid Abdul Fadl, he basically breaks it down to say it's a difference between authority and authoritarian. So if you speak with authority about your faith tradition, you claim a certain traditional, traditional epistemological understanding of your tradition, right? And you present that and people follow you or they disagree with you. But if you are being authoritarian, then you claim that religion has mandated you, you specifically, and that you speak and only you speak in the name of God. And only you are allowed to legitimately interpret the scripture or whatever it is that you have. And then you can see how that um, turns out into having a specific understanding of religion and theology. Most people grapple with and have huge problems, right? To the point where people would say it's almost the moral standpoint to be anti-religious if that is religion, if that is what religion is about. If religion mandates the individual to dictate what others ought to do, then the only moral thing to do would be to oppose that, right? But that is sort of a tradition within um, and you can see that in the contemporary context of Islam, I would argue that by and large the debates that are circulating in Islam are very much driven by the, by the authoritarian exclusive idea of some people telling others what to do and what to believe and how to actually think about things. So we, the Muslim um, intellectual public discourse has lost a little bit the idea of uh, having authority over authoritarian. So the idea of philosophical theology in modern context, um, that's what I said in, in you know, that um, sort of contemporary philosophical inquiries are not satisfactorily accounted for in recent scholarship in Islamic theology. So you do not have the issue of you know, a scholar saying like, you know what, I'm going to talk about Jack Derrida and see how that can help me to understand my theology better. It's just not happening. You won't have that sort of account. Um, and the, the question, to me now is after the prelude um, to all of that is if I want to engage with modern philosophies, how do I do that and where do I start? Right? Taking Kant's point where things change upside down and you do not have any more the metaphysical debate, but you have a sort of bewildering fusion of different philosophical a philosophy of freedom, philosophy of language. Um, you have the philosophy of what we call literary philosophy of the Nietzschean tradition, right? Um, you have to understand where can I actually start with the whole debate. 
right? Either you go on a very systematic approach and you deal with systematic philosophers who pretty much in the tradition of Aristotle look at the sections and the divisions of sciences and go systematically by each point. Or, and that's what I try to do, you tackle someone who actually approaches philosophy with an, what we call literary approach, where the idea of philosophy is basically carried out in a narrative. So it is not necessarily systematic and you know painstakingly on the point, but it rather evolves around philosophical issues that each and somewhat combined with each other are being tackled and then talked about. And then came Nietzsche. Uh, I don't know whether you can read actually the so it says, Well, I understand by philosopher uh, a terrible explosive in the presence of which everything is in danger. One might add in Grave danger. Nietzsche. Um, I want to now talk very briefly about Nietzsche before I go on and talk about Camus. Nietzsche is known by many labels, and um, he really doesn't fit any of them exclusively. I mean, he's known as the anti-moralist who denied free will and consequently good and evil, the anti-enlightenment -anti philosopher who devalued values, the nihilist, and so forth. Nietzsche is held by some, accountable at least, to some degree, for the horrors of the, uh, to come in the first half of the 20th century. His Ubermensch created, so does the critique conclude, a new paradigm of social hierarchy in human society. The theory of social Darwinism extracted and applied the findings of the evolutionary theory to human society. The survival of the fittest narrative, as you know became part of the intellectual toolbox of rising nationalism in Europe. And finally, this all paved the way for the racist politics of the next generation. However, I mean, this criticism of Nietzsche's work somewhat stands in harsh contrast with Nietzsche's personal life. So ignoring his life and his personal context may well lead up to this um, you know, criticism. However, if you look at his lifelong suffering, if you look at his personal crises, uh, you will see the interpretation shifts quite dramatically. To make it brief, Nietzsche was a genius uh, who received tenure at the age of 24. A deeply troubled man with a varying degree of antisocial behavior, an extreme introvert, a man with a compromised health, neurological disorder he suffered from his whole life. He never married, never had any kind of long-lasting emotional or physical relationship to a woman. Some argue he, he must have been or was homosexual, it's sort of denied by the majority of scholars. And as far as we can assess, he fell in love once to Lou Salome, a Russian intelligentsia, who was breaking through the barriers of misogyny and sexism in the late 19th century. She never considered marrying him, although he proposed to her three times. She was intellectually attracted to Nietzsche, but preferred to have a relationship with his best friend instead. And this is the small picture I'm giving you, so it's not the full wall of Nietzsche. Um, so throughout his life, Nietzsche suffered many mental breakdowns. During a vacation in Italy, he tried to befriend a horse publicly. And uh, he was hospitalized soon after, and he never recovered from this incident. He sh shortly decayed, both physically and intellectually, and finally died at the age of 56. If a philosopher declares the death of God, he's either trying to provoke an argument, or, in case of Nietzsche, expresses a deeply felt sense of loneliness in the face of physical and emotional suffering. I think Nietzsche fits both categories. He was an outcast, suffering from social discrimination, highly sensitive and empathetic person who could see beyond and between the lines of meaning, in search for meaning and belonging, he turned to all existing cultural and religious entities. Not only could those institutions, and most prominently in his case, the Christian church, I mean, he comes from a family of priests. Like his father was a priest, his grandfather was a priest, so he's pretty much uh, he's grown up in, a, you know, what you would call a Christian cultural, religious cultural environment. None of them provided a satisfactory response to his inquiries. And they left him aggravated and even a, even a deeper sense of despair. This was Nietzsche's emotional state when he gave birth to his Ubermensch. His movement is a projection, a stronger, more resistant version of himself, who can, unlike himself, actually endure the physical and emotional hardships he was confronted with. It is an attempt to flee from the contradictions of life, from social segregation, discrimination, and loneliness. The Ubermensch is stripped of morality because, according to Nietzsche, 
suffering in this world to have a better life in the world hereafter is not more. <coughs> this explanation why suffering exists in the world becomes particularly problematic when it's used by representatives of the faith tradition to justify the suffering of the other. That is a very crucial moment in uh, Nietzsche's philosophy, and of course you can track it back all the way to the Greeks, where Aristotle would define the virtue as to be taking care of the other, right? That is virtuous, if you think of the other. And if you now, in modernity, as Nietzsche argues, if you try to explain the suffering of the other, then it becomes immoral. immoral. Um, in Nietzsche's understanding, the only possible answer one could give is declaring its own immorality, uh, or in other words, the death of God. Nietzsche went beyond the existing categories of good and bad and turned the world of values, literally, upside down. He wanted to bring an end to his suffering, break through the horrors of his physical and emotional agony. He really tried and couldn't find any solace anywhere except in the refuge of his own thoughts, his safe haven, his very own world that gave him room to breathe, that accepted him for who he was. The outcast refused to play the game according to the rules. Instead, he invented his own rules. And by that, actually, replacing a close and absolute worldview, and in that case, we could say Christianity, or even you know, Enlightenment philosophy he was criticizing, with enough, with his own. His passion for writing, his mastery of the language, his endless reservoir of vivid metaphors, his bewildering creativity is profoundly remarkable and so powerful that almost nothing can stand in its way. The shock waves of, that are created by Nietzsche push the reset button and you suddenly find yourself panicking because you don't know where you stored the backup software. This is really, it leaves you behind with a deep sense of confusion. Without wanting to drift more into sentimentalities, I'd really like to compare the study of Nietzsche to falling in love. Studying Nietzsche is reported to have the same effects like falling in love. So if you haven't fallen in love yet and you want to understand what, how that feels, you, know, um, <laughs> you might want to read Nietzsche. Better yet, first learn German and then read Nietzsche. <laughs> Nietzsche's writing, in my understanding, is the utmost expression of pain and suffering. It originates from the same epicenter, that's why I'm comparing it to love. In us, that is capable of generating the inexplicable intricacies of emotions like love. At the same time, his writing is also a cry for meaning in this world, a cry for help, and maybe even love, or wanted to be loved. One might say his philosophy is a radical monologue the audience is allowed to attend, a silent bystander. The question for me is now, what can we take from this for a philosophical theology? And the answers I'm going to give at the end, actually combined when I also talk about Camus. Camus would be the next person. And in many ways, Camus and his philosophy is um, sort of a continuation of Nietzsche. In other ways, he was quite different. But it remains uh, sort of um, interesting to look at that Camus' identity as a philosopher is ambiguous. Um, and his own relation to philosophy is ambiguous. And he hesitated to identify as a philosopher. And other times he was actually, by especially Jean Paul Sartre, often dismissed as a philosopher. Um, it's interesting to see in Camus that he has, he has written a variety of different things. He has written many journalistic articles, he has written many essays. But essentially, if you boil it down, he has actually two philosophical works, two theoretical philosophical works that are accompanied by two novels. So the interesting issue with, Nietzsche, uh, with Camus is that each novel he has written is sort of a counterpart to a theoretical philosophical idea. Right? So the two uh, novels and theoretical works I'm going to look at is The Stranger, which accompanies the myth of Sisyphus, and then The Plague with the Rebel. The path, I mean, the context in, in the case of Camus, what, you, what we need to know is uh, the end of World War II. So we have the annihilation of more than 20 million people um, in, in Europe. Uh, we have mass murders. We have um, the attempt to uh, basically wipe out um, Jewish um, people and ethnicity from Europe. And he now is trying to make sense of this world. And he, all he can see is nothing but observance everywhere. So to him, this all makes no sense. Interestingly, the idea of the observed role already exists before him. I mean, Kierkegaard is the one who has actually introduced that idea. Nietzsche picks it up. Others pick it up before him. But he does something that no one else before him did in the same way that affected people. He wrote a novel about it, The Stranger. 
And it kind of encapsulated the whole notion that people felt, but no one expressed in a way how Camus actually did. The novel The Stranger is a very short novel. Um, and it's about a, a person who lives and works in Algeria, um, where he was born and raised. Uh, and, you know, it's quite, um, I mean, you, you, you start reading the novel and you ask yourself, what is this all about? It's very dry. The guy has no passion whatsoever. He goes to work, he comes back. If some women are interested in him, he couldn't be less interested in them. You know, sometimes his neighbor calls him and they go and have a drink together. Uh, other times he goes to the cafe and, you know, just the novel unfolds itself. I know, his mom dies at some point, he just notices that, goes to the funeral, he's annoyed because it's so hot, right, you know, he wants to go back home, and then one day, he's at the beach, he's trying to pull off, and he shoots a guy. He kills a man. So, the Arab has no name, it's an Arab. Uh, they have a dispute, he goes off, comes back in, and shoots him. Right? And then he sits in front of the judge, and he's asking, why did you kill the man? And he deeply feels that he has no responsibility. He actually doesn't know why he killed the man. And he is very honest about it. Which, of course, you know, in a juridical system, you usually have an intention why you do something, right? And you are judged by that intention so forth. So he, and that's how the world feels, upside down. It makes absolutely no sense. He doesn't have no explanation to himself or to someone else why he has killed that person. And everyone sits there and doesn't understand what happened here. Why did it happen? And how can you make sense of it? And that's what Camus says. You cannot make sense of it. Right? There's a huge tension between my cry for sense, my cry for meaning, and the silent world that says nothing. It is the case of Sisyphus, who is carrying the rock all the way up to the top of the uh, mountain, and then it falls back down, and he starts again. And it goes back and forth. And that's what he does. So we are enclosed in that circle. We can't break out. We cannot make any sense of it. It's what life is about. Right? So he has, without, like he doesn't necessarily offer a solution. What he does is he states the status quo. Right? In the most interesting way, with the novel and uh, theoretical work that accompanies it. But he also understands himself that, okay, this is, no, this is not going anywhere. I need to do something. And that is where he enters the second phase, where he understands, though, you know, just by crying out that the world is absurd, I'm not going to help anyone. I'm not helping myself. It doesn't satisfy me. So he moves on to the next stage. In this case, he writes The Plague. The novel, again, it takes place in an Algerian city. Uh, the city is um, under, you know, plague, sort of, and everyone is dying slowly. It's, it's horrible. They have closed up the city. No one can leave. No one can come in. And um, there is, you know, the center of that novel is the death of a child. And that child is suffering. Right? And he's Camus explaining at great lengths how you know death is coming slowly to the child and everyone is speechless and you know is trying to cope with the emotions. And then there is the figure of the priest Panu, who explains why the child has to die. Right? He gives an explanation, he says basically this is God's world, this is how God has created this world. And even if you don't see any meaning in this child's death, it can be maybe explained with an afterlife. Right? That's exactly the point that Camus is trying to tackle and see this makes no sense. Ex trying to explain to me that this child has died in the most you know, heart-wrenching way it could be possible in front of our eyes, literally decaying slowly, in pain, suffering, and you come along and tell me that it has a higher cause because it's justified by God's rule. And then what Camus basically says, I deny that God, I deny that rule, and I'm not accepting the death of this child, I will not stand by and basically say to the parents of this child, but he'll be fine in the next one. It is in his understanding, the moral standpoint, to rebel and oppose against that faith or that explanation. Right? It is what then the theoretical work the, the rebel does. He cries out meaning in the name of humanity. He says if we do not have any values that we can hold on and defend, against the immorality in this world. What I can do is I can actually claim to be standing with those who suffer, with those who are being segregated, with those who are being treated unjustly. And I can hold up value, and I can see value in the human instead of trying to explain or find value outside the human. Um, so, as, you know, if I put it down here, if I can't prevent harm from happening, I can at least call it out and protest its occurrence. 
the rebellion on, on behalf of the silent victims, on behalf of humanity. But as with Nietzsche, Camus also, and you can read that in his, um, in his writings, there is a deep sense of loneliness and vulnerability. Right? Nietzsche, in terms of his personal life, and Camus, in terms of his surrounding life and with others. There's a very deep sense of vulnerability, a very deep sense of being left alone, not cared for, not understood, and even in the most difficult point where you lose someone, that uh, no one is actually taking you seriously in the way you suffer. So I'm going to finish with three, um, basically, uh, hypotheses of how theology could learn from these two accounts. So no set of beliefs can justify the suffering of both individuals and groups of people, and most particularly, as it Camus has shown, the case of children. Under no circumstances should theology attempt to justify the suffering of the other, either by reverting to an afterlife or an underlying meaning that this is not accessible. We cannot understand why certain things happen. We just have to trust God that there is a meaning which will be revealed to us in an afterlife. So that is not acceptable. However, and that's important to understand, it's perfectly fine if you want to justify your own suffering. Right? If you are going through crises, if you are dealing with issues in your life, and you're making sense by them by reverting to God, or by reverting to your afterlife, and it only is limited to yourself, that's perfectly fine. And you will find theological accounts that will actually entertain this idea and support that idea. It becomes problematic when you start to justify the suffering of the other. Then you assume a moral high ground that is not justified. And that is actually ridiculing the, the victim of suffering. Because you pretend that you could see and understand what this individual goes through. Secondly, um, the human experience teaches us that mankind operates apparently in a state of methodological doubt or inherent skepticism towards the reality, towards our reality. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece in the Quran, actually, that sort of exemplifies that beautifully. It's about Abraham, so the uh, archfather of the three monotheistic religions. And there is a part where Abraham, you know, according to the divine spirit, he's conversing with God, right? So the idea is basically he's you know, in some some kind of communication, however, whatever that means and however that is being implemented. And he asks God, can you please show me how you create life out of death? And it's amazing because God asked the question, oh, wait a minute, you don't believe? I mean, we have been going through things together, right? I have been supporting you all along. You have been uh, driven off your home country. I have been supporting you. You have been having issues with your wife, I have been there for you, and now you're asking me, I mean, you have been my prophet, I've chosen you, and you have been basically conveying the truth, and now you're asking me, you want to know whether I can create life out of death? I mean, it has like a very rhetorical question, it's like, you don't believe? And Abraham responds, uh, it's a beautiful uh, Arabic line, Bala wala tatme in kalbi. I do, I do, he's like, he wants to assert that I do believe, but I have doubts in that. So I doubt. There are, there is a shred of doubt that exists in my heart. And I just want to get rid of that doubt by watching, seeing you create life out of death. So apparently that you know, metaphor in the plan exemplifies there is some inherent skepticism in us. But we are also capable of critiquing, basically, what I tried to show with Kant, the apparatus that we are operating with. We know basically that we are somewhat biased. Our faculty of reason operates within certain parameters and doesn't operate outside of them. So the deconstructing the layers that process our interpretations, our understanding of the world, will eventually help us to understand the human condition. And finally, and that is where I come into certainty. So it seems that our certainties, both about ourselves as much as about the world we live in, and the multiple contexts we see ourselves woven into, are more vulnerable than we want to admit. This may even be true about our faith. Embracing the assumption that our certainties are wounded, that we essentially doubt and are affected by doubts, may help us to realign our relationship with certainties. Eventually, this shift in comprehending how we operate with certainties could help us to open ourselves to the human experience. Thank you. Do we have some time for questions? Would you like to get to us? Of course, definitely. Uh, questions?
comments? Um, so when Kumus said we shouldn't um, say like the kids going to heaven or whatever, uh, what was his reasoning? Was it because it's intellectually dishonest or um, yeah? It, what he says is doubling the world. So basically, I only have the world I can live in, and I'm living in currently. If you double that world and tell me that there is another world I cannot see, I cannot sense, I can have no access to, it's truly and only speculative. It becomes unjust. You know, it becomes my world, and the life I'm living in is being devalued at the point where you tell me that in the other world it will have value. But it's all about this world. I live only in this world, and I can only guarantee by the sheer existence that I have this world. I cannot guarantee the other world. So if you're trying to transfer value into the other world, it becomes unjust and it becomes a Because there's no guarantees. There's no, basically, that's like speculative, right? It could be, it could not be, but it also means that you're not taking me seriously in this world, right? You may, you tell me into my face that I have to suffer, uh, but you are not the one who's suffering. I am suffering. And you're not the one who's going through my life. I am. And you don't have any right to tell me how I should feel or how I should live. That's Camus' standpoint. So, um, so the, 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 the two figures that you picked out are very interesting, provocative that you would pick those two figures out. Because, I mean, if you think about it uh, from, let's say, Christian theology, I think a lot of Christian theologians would, would identify those two figures as deeply untheological, yeah. right? Uh, as as deeply untheological as they get. Yeah. And Probably. as you you know, I mean, you know, the, there's a lot of philosophers there. You know, right. Yeah, that fit that category. But um, uh, so, is there something about specific aspects of the Islamic theologian tradition or specific thinkers that you would you've been drawing on in some aspect of the Islamic theologian tradition that you think would find it particular find the lessons that you were drawing out of these two philosophers particularly amenable to their own theological project. I wouldn't be able to point out um, individuals, but what I can point out is methodologically speaking, that those two philosophers are operating with the narrative, as does Islamic theology, interestingly. So that's why I can dock on to them. They are creating a narrative, a story which is essentially what the Quran does. So, um, you know, the theological and philosophical ideas are being carried in the Muslim faith through a story, basically. And you know, uh, even the understanding of that story is not just by reason, it actually has an aesthetic value, and we have to employ, you know, aesthetics in order to understand the whole breadth of that story. So, it, I find similarities to Nietzsche, who has an extremely beautiful art of writing, and there is a collision with the content of that writing. So there's a sharp contrast between how beautifully he writes and what he actually says. And in some ways, it's very similar to the Quran. So when you listen to the Quranic narrative, it's interesting. So within the theological tradition, Quran doesn't constitute itself when it's only in a book. So you know, like people come and say, like, I have the Quran at home, and I've been reading it, and blah, blah. I can assure you, it's not the Quran you're reading, OK? Because for it to be Quran, it has to be constituted in a certain specific form. It has to be recited according to the rules. Only if that aesthetic value comes in place, recitation, along with the capacity to understand its meaning, then it constitutes Quran. If you read the book, so theologically we speak of reading the Mus'haf. Mus'haf means you translate the book. So if you read the book silently, that doesn't constitute Quran. Only if you recite it, and only if you have the capacity of understanding the recitation, then you have the concept. So apparently, you need the aesthetics of the recitation in comparison with the, um, the reasonable access to the meaning of it. And only if those two get together, then we speak of Quran. Then we speak of the, and Quran means actually the thing that is being recited. So there is a very interesting momentum of a story to be told in a specific way to become normative. And I find that interesting to see the same patterns effectively in work with Camus and Nietzsche. In both cases, 
I mean, Camus uh, a little more because he has that narrative in, in the form of a novel. It's like it explains it as a novel, right? And Nietzsche has that beauty in his writing. He doesn't specifically talk about his writing as to be, you know, novel-like writing, but it is in there. And I can't deny it. When I read it, I'm like captured by it, right? And it does affect my understanding of Nietzsche. And the same is true for Camus. So there are, I would say, um, you know, these methodological similarities that draw me to compare these two with but not a single person I could single out and say that's what he has written before. It is not done. It's basically a plain field that hasn't been worked at. And of course, I've been asked, why don't you tackle someone else? Right? Why don't you go and start with a more systematic approach? It would be maybe easier, because you can systematically go and prove or disprove and prove. <coughs> but it doesn't carry for me the same weight as um, these two carry. And then, of course, both of them are in sort of a fight with Christianity, one way or the other, right? I mean, Camus is in, in the play, he is, of course, criticizing Christianity with, you know, uh, represented by Panin with the priest. And Nietzsche, of course, is attacking Christianity very aggressively. So both of them have an issue with theology. And I want to understand what that issue is. And I, at the same point, I do have to understand and learn from it, right? So what is going on with these two? And they have both a very deep understanding of Christianity. Camus' master thesis is on ancient Christianity. I mean, that's what he started working with, right? And it carried him throughout his entire work. And he constantly is dealing with that religion, although he explained himself to be agnostic. But it, I find it extremely appealing to understand what his concerns were. And I can, and I am learning from that deeply in my own tradition. I'm not sure whether I fully understand what your project is. Uh, are you providing a description of um, the theological tensions uh, or potentials in the Islamic history, or are you providing a kind of a prescription for how theologians or reasonably learned, uh, intelligent theologians of today should behave? And I'm not sure whether I fully agree with your um, assertion that uh, you know, Muslim theologians have not engaged contemporary Muslim theologians have not engaged European philosophers. That's certainly not the case in Iran, for instance. There has been a tremendous amount of dialogue with the hermeneutic tradition, with, with Heidegger, with Gadamer, and so on and so forth. That doesn't happen in the Sunni world, certainly, that, which has to do with the entirely different tradition in Shiism compared to Sunnism. But I'm not sure whether, uh, you know, following the question, as by Michael earlier, whether I see a project which has a lot of purchase because you have chosen exactly two thinkers who don't even get on particularly well with Christian theologians and you expect Muslim theologians to embrace them or embrace their style or a certain way of thinking. I'm not sure whether I fully, and also I'm not sure whether I agree with your, um, you know, psychologization of the you know, thinking of Nietzsche and, and Camus because, I mean, you could apply the same principles to many, many thinkers yes. and, and explain their peculiarities in terms of their personal histories. And yes. As historians, I would welcome that, but uh, there is a lot more to, to Nietzsche than simply suffering. After all, he was concerned with, uh, I mean, what he found unacceptable was the idea of pointless suffering, not suffering per se. Of course. I mean, there are varieties of suffering which, which exist, but what is unbearable is a kind of suffering which cannot be explained in a meaningful and, uh, and acceptable way. So, what is it that you are trying to do? I mean, are you trying to enlighten, as I said, theologians today who are misguided or perhaps narrow-minded? Or are you trying to uh, read the past in the light of current sensibilities? What is it that you are doing? Uh, excellent questions, thank you. Uh, I'll try to, uh, if I forget one of those points you raised, please remind me. So one thing is I don't expect others to change the belief system. As I said before, it's an open sort of access discourse, and you contribute by presenting um, your idea. Whether or not the community of believers take it up, think that it's actually worthwhile thinking about, that is out of my hands. I cannot basically impact the way how, since it's a you know, theological discourse, whether it's going to impact the way how people feel and believe. So that is, but what I see in myself is the responsibility to contribute, right? To open up a debate, and it is um, 
sort of left to the community of scholars, of believers, of everyone else who finds inclined to respond to that. So that is an open process. I do not expect anyone to do anything. It is a contribution to the debate. The issue I have is, um, what I do here specifically, is I want to convince people. And the reason why I started off with this historical prelude is I am showing in my dissertation that what I do now in the contemporary context is nothing new. It has been done in the past. And I go through that process painstakingly to show how it is being done, to prove that there is validity in doing it this way. That is not, and that is, you know, in a, in a theological discourse in contemporary times that, that is highly um, driven by the question of authenticity, right? Where people say, this is not authentically Islam. I'm trying to prove that when I say I can tackle Nietzsche and Camus, that's very Islamic. It's been done in the past with other philosophers accordingly and I'm not doing anything outside the box. This is actually a continuation of a process that has happened, right? And as you pointed well, out, she is that. Give examples, I mean, we, uh, give examples of the medieval period, which well, I mean, you right, let's start. We can go and start with Al-Kindi, right? Yes. And he goes with the Greek, I mean, he translates, not only translates, but also writes philosophical yeah. accounts of Proclus. He writes about Aristotelian Nicomachean ethics. Yeah. He has Neoplatonic works. He has the ancient commentaries on Greek philosophy. Then you go on with Farabi, who's more Aristotelian. Sure, but right. I mean, and Kesi and Farabi were not theologians; they were philosophers. But well, here's the thing: yes. I argue and that's a debate within Islam. Right? What is a Muslim philosopher? And what is a Muslim theologian? Many of those works. I mean, first of all, it's all constructed after you know Farabi didn't say. I'm, a, you know, I'm, he didn't say that I'm not a Mutakelian. Uh, he didn't well, he did say that, actually. Well, you know, the thing he was, was very critical of the theologians. He was very critical of the Mutakelian, yes. yes. But his work has been used by the Mutakelian. Right? Sure. So there is, is an impact of when yes. I say the branches existed yeah. and they overlapped. So they have been used <coughs> in some sequence. Even if he hasn't qualified himself as a Mutakelian, which means uh, theologian. He has been used by theologians, and his philosophy or Islamic philosophical theology has been used by others. So it's common sense to believe, for instance, that even those people like Miskaway, yeah. who hasn't written a single uh, theological work, has done philosophical theology, right? So, and it's believed that he has philosophical theological works. So um, that is to try of like, you know, looking into the past because it's a theological debate where people always relate to the past because it's always built onto each other. That's what I do with uh, getting my credentials from the past. That's that project. And you're right. I mean, I said it's not done satisfactorily. I didn't say it's not happening at all, right? It is happening. As you pointed out, in Iran there is you know, quite a amount of work done with many modern philosophers. But is it satisfactory? No, it's not enough. And I would even say, in terms of Sunni Islam, it's almost not existent. Very few people. I mean, I'm happy to learn about it if, if someone is working, with it, but it's very few. It's very marginalized. So that's what I'm trying to do with this project. I'm trying to combine, get the credentials from the past and apply them in the present, right? Whether or not, and I mean, you're right, my work is met very critically. And it's good. I like it that it's being met critically. Uh, because at the end of the day, it means that people start thinking about these issues. I don't think, I don't claim to be like totally redefining the field. I would be very happy if I can initiate debate, actually. And if it would be just about defining what I've done, still people would need to take a stand. At this point, nothing is happening. I mean, no one is reading. Why is it that you are not, it seems to me, not particularly sympathetic to the, let's say, to the rationalist tradition among the Mortazovites? No, that is not true. Well, I mean, choosing Nietzsche and, and Camus is not yeah. exactly a prescription for but the promotion of uh, rationality and so forth that many Muslims consider at the moment. I mean, there is a kind of trend in, in the Islamic world against postmodernity. I mean, there are many you trends. Know, in and <laughs> we tend to enlighten them that you, many, many of them would want perhaps embracing Kant rather than Nietzsche. Why and not? I'm absolutely, this is the thing, I'm absolutely fine, I'm not excluding, I make a choice by, but since it's a theological debate, I'm making a choice by a very personal account. Right? I explained that by the idea of aesthetics playing a role, the narrative playing a role. Um, and I am more than happy to listen to someone else, actually Beheshti, if you know him in Iran, is doing Kant, and it's incredible, it's interesting. 
but it's not something that I find interesting to, like, to engage with personally, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, and I want to say, it's, again, the plurality of opinions, I appreciate that very much. It doesn't restrict me to do a specific thing. I don't have someone who tells me to do something. I can do what I find interesting. Let's just, just ask one question when you mention. <laughs> do you have to be a theologian in order to count, or you just have to be what a Muslim, or happen to be you know culturally Muslim, or do you have to be a theologian to do some yeah, of these things that right. you're interested in? These are separate matters. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The question also expands to other fields. Like, what do you do if someone? We had this debate with my wife. What do you do if someone is a very devout Catholic and a sociologist? Yeah, I mean, there are many, not just the supermarkets. Yeah, but what do you do if someone is a scientist and at the same time a very devout Christian? How far does his Christian identity impact his, let's say, sociology, right? Some say openly it does. I mean, he is normative in his claims, and he does admit that Christianity plays a very important role in the way how he sees the world. All of his sociological writing is, you know, up to date, is scientific, is acclaimed by the peers. And yet, Christianity plays a very important role in it. So can I take it out? What so we so let's, uh, I, I know there was more, more lines of inquiry here to pursue, but are there any other questions? Any other comments? Yeah. Yeah, a couple, but let me start with this one. So um, I'm interested in um, something you said about the plurality of opinions. Yeah. So um, maybe you said that the, the three branches of theology are mutually, oh, so you didn't say this is a question, are they meant to be mutually reinforcing and responding to one another? You said that there, there are certain normative and epistemic standards to which they ought themselves to be subject. Are those, how are those determined? Where do they come from? Right. Or what's, the, what's the source of that? So when you have, for instance, questions related, so there's absolutely no debate about rituals, for instance, you know, like praying five times a day, fasting and all of doing the pilgrimage. You won't find, I mean, you will find 99% of agreement across the aisle. Right, so that you won't have much debate um, how to enact those rituals. But when it comes to, let's say, inheritance law, so when it comes to divorce, when it comes to uh, specific issues, there you will have a variety of different opinions. And you won't find these necessarily in philosophical theology. Right? You will find them in juridical theology. So you will have a branch of uh, you know, hermeneutics in which people have thought about this issue and came to put. And yet, still, there is you know, a variety of different opinions, and it depends on which school. Interesting, what I find very interesting is, for instance, one thing. Muslim schools of thought are always connected to a person. Even the Mu'tazila, which means like the ones who actually segregate themselves from mainstream, that's what Mu'tazila means, I segregate myself from mainstream. Even them, they have become to be known Mu'tazila, but they started with one person, and it goes because it's a human enterprise, it's a human interpretation of the divine. No one would associate and say this is the only existing or you know authoritarian aspect. Always relate to a single person who has been the source of that interpretation. And that means human interpretation is bound to change. Right? So it's a process of change which uh, of course has an interplay with the context in which you live and so forth. So as much as the branches of those three you know epistemologies overlap, they also have a distinctiveness to them, right? And no, depending on what you want from the world in your experience, you turn towards each of them. You don't have to think sort of you are in one and you won't exit that. No, you're pretty much, and it, it assumes that the single person is very, of course, aware of these things, open, and can access them and can differentiate and operate within the systems, right? Um, and on the other hand, of course, we will have Sufis who will never be fine with judicial theology. I mean, that just like, rubs them the wrong way. They can never be able to operate within those realms. They don't see the world that way, right? So you have all kinds of uh, plural, and it is confusing. It can be from, from from the outside to make sense of it. It's yeah. So so there's it's, there's quite a bit of overlap in sort of um, uh, shared background or yeah. shared um, yeah. sensibly, but there's many um, methods. Is yeah. That yeah. You kept saying methods. Thank you. Yeah. This might be related to one of your questions. Um, I'm just wondering where, so two and three on your list, where they apply. So one was about skepticism and the other was about sort of certainty. When you were saying the lessons that Islamic theology can yeah, uh -huh, from common yeah. nature. So yeah. is that, do you mean to say there that the sort of uh, skepticism 
and our vulnerability is something personally that they need to be developing, or is it something that's lacking in their interpretations, so they should read these philosophers and include this in their interpretations? Again, it is a reaction to a reality <coughs> in which people will come to you and say, I have doubts, over and over again. This is a theological topic that is not being tackled openly, because it's you know, sort of defied to have doubts about a belief system, right? If you dare to speak about your doubts, like, for instance, Salman Rushdie and his satanic verses, right? It is actually, I read that as a scripture of doubts. He like, <coughs> exposes all of his doubts in a literary work. It's been an unusual reaction that people show to it, right? So it uh, poses a threat, a danger to their system of belief. And it's been immediately pushed away. And what I'm trying to say is that's wrong. Uh, first of all, everyone, as the Quranic example shows, uh, even prophets, uh, frankly, aren't doubting, right? So uh, pushing that away is the wrong method to go about it. Uh, to the contrary, you have to include it and be acceptive of it so that it's part of your system. That's how you operate, but you can work with it, right? And working with it means basically that you can overcome those thoughts and operate with them or accept them. And you do not have to have a response to everything that pops up in your life. I mean, it is also extremely liberating to say, I don't know, right? I mean, that's again part of the authority and the, the idea that you cannot always come up with a response to things that pop up in the human experience, right? And it does leave you speechless, and it does uh, leave you behind with a, a variety of different questions that you operate with. So the concern is something like um, the threat of doubt, right, could pose yeah. the problem that might undermine somebody's exactly. belief system. Yeah. And we can take from Camus and Nietzsche that we don't have to deny the doubt exists. We can use it as a premise and an exactly. argument that ultimately justifies our yeah. To the contrary, if you actually deny the existence of doubt, it will amplify it. The way of, and I read Nietzsche like that, it's amplified, right? It was denied that you can have doubts. And, it, and of course, going back to the question, I'm, I'm interpreting Nietzsche. <laughs> yes, there were movements much more to his work, but I am singling out something that I find valuable to attack. And yes, it's, I mean, that's the Aristotelian method. You reduce, and you work with that what you reduce. It doesn't mean that there is much more to Nietzsche or Camus. But those are the things that I find worth tackling and working with, right? And um, whether or not you bring in other aspects, it's up to you, up to questions you have. So my specific questions were about the suffering of the other and the suffering that has no meanings and doubts that come along with it. Well, thank you. It's a very intriguing uh, perspective. Uh, I uh, have the same kind of question about the selection, that is the, uh, uh, you said that you brought the three together the, uh, because they all subscribe to this narrative yeah. me methodology and so connecting element. But then what do they say in that methodology are quite different, even Camus and Nietzsche would be different. And Quran is ultimately different because I mean you pick up this thing about Abraham's uh, doubts but then uh, yeah the prophets show defiance and they are penalized and then they ultimately don't come back to the faith and they uh, so um, it wouldn't count as your way of reading but my reading your Quran is like if there is a single message in the Quran, in fact, a single purpose is monotheism, the faith, and without any doubt that you have to believe in God. Every verse, uh, uh, a, a would would be almost the like I concluded. God knows. God gives. God punishes. God watches, and so on. Uh, so I, I really need a little more convincing for this. It's interesting how you read the Quran. That's exactly the opposite of how I read it. Then, so, then I need this, yeah. <laughs> See, uh, uh, how, well, when I said the impetus stems from the divine and it goes back to the divine, the narrative of the Quran is not like there is God and you ought to believe. Then you better believe or you will be you know, in, in hell if you don't. That's not the, the way how the Quran operates. The Quran operates to me, it's unfolding and it's bound to the human experience and it unfolds along those lines. Right? It, 
At points, it leaves you behind with questions. It's very unsatisfying. I mean, like, I'm, I'm there, and the, you know, the Quranic narrative abruptly ends. And then I'm like, wait a second, what am I going to do with this, right? And then it starts off somewhere totally else, and it seems erratic. So it is a thing, as with any other story, it is something that you have to constantly retell, constantly engage with, and then suddenly new aspects of that story pop up that haven't been accessible to you because you have changed, because your life has unfolded, because you have gained experiences. So engaging with the Quran is not just an issue, and that's why I said like the notion of sitting down and reading. When I when we recite in a circle of people and we let the recitation pass, and then I you know, we start like thinking, what happened? You have 10 different voices, you have 10 people, 10 different experiences, 10 different issues that relate to that narrative. And every time someone tells his story, that narrative becomes reinterpreted. It's a very lively, very ongoing process that goes beyond the literal meaning, right? It is unfolding in a community of thinkers, of people who are not just theoretically making sense of the story, but who are humans and who bring in their human experience. And that's how I became to understand the Quran. So, uh, and that of course shapes my understanding and interpretation of Nietzsche and Camus uh, philosophy. I don't know, it's like seeing the human experience connection to that is um, in, in is raising doubts. I, I don't think they are the same. When, let's say, let's break it down to a very specific idea within the Quran. So if you have, for instance, a passage that talks about the issue of and those who will believe will not fear death, and they will not fear the afterlife, right? Mm -hmm. And then someone comes and says, you know what, I do fear the afterlife, I do fear death. And it suddenly becomes an issue that the Qur'an initiates a debate. It doesn't, in that point, sort of points, puts an end to a debate, and it just says, you know, people who believe in God and the Qur'an ought not to be afraid of the afterlife or death. No it's been understood as a way of opening up in, and creating a place and a space in which people can actually openly talk about what they are afraid of. And in this case, death. Right? So in this moment, the Quran gives us a reason to talk about a very natural human experience to be afraid of death. And that's something Camus, his entire life, is circulating around the issue of being afraid about death. I mean, he was, you know, he uh, had a... Um, serious uh, sickness in his youth and it accompanied him, he could have died any time. And that was always something that it was carrying him throughout his entire life. So when I see that Quranic narrative, and I see how Camus is struggling with, you know, fear of death, I see a connection. And I can, I can see a, a bridge where I can combine two, and I admit, very distinctly different narratives, but they have something that I can talk about. Some uh, Christian philosophers and theologians, um, and they give arguments for something like the problem of evil. I sometimes find myself thinking, like, um, you know, you're really stretching yourself here, and uh, why don't you just say, yeah, I have no idea how to answer this, but I believe in spite of it because all the evidence for every reason, right? Yeah, and so I think. Yeah, it's interesting that you seem to be turning to Nietzsche and Camus to sort of make that argument, if I'm right. So they say, look, you don't, you could just say, I don't know, and it's okay. Um, I'm curious, well, two things. One is, uh, do Islamic philosophers or theologians, are they more likely than Christian theologians to just say, I don't know, or do they do the sort of same thing? I don't, I have no idea. And, um, if you are going to use Camus and uh, Nietzsche to make the case, which I wish would be making more often, that I don't have the answer, but I'm going to believe for the reasons. I mean, is that kind of dangerous, since they weren't religious at all, um, and using them as the poster child for a religious argument might be troublesome? Absolutely. I mean, there is a danger of uh, ending up to instrumentalize Nietzsche and Camus for an interpretation they you know fought their entire life mm -hmm. and, and just like turn and basically make something something different out of that, right? That is a danger that you have to grapple with, that you have to fight with. 
um, it's a very delicate line. So you have to take that thought seriously enough not to undermine it. But at the same time, you have to show sincerely that there is something that reaches out to you. Right? And I think it is legitimate to say there is something that reaches out to me and that is part of my debate that I'm having with myself. And it is legitimate to say that I can learn from the way how he dealt with this um, and maybe take something home. Right? Um, and it is, in an okay, there's a disclaimer at the end of any treatise in which says, and God knows better, which is a disclaimer to say there is a limit to our knowledge. There is, you know, a line we have to draw. And we're trying the best, and that's also like my attempt, is that we're trying the best of my uh, talents to bring something here together that hopefully will make sense, that hopefully will help people to, um, you know, open up new issues. But I also, there is a chance of failing. Of course, and it doesn't make sense, and some people will not be able to follow you, and that's something that uh, any theologian works with and has to incorporate. And there is, like historically speaking, many theologians just got famous way after they died, <laughs> because you know they've seen things that was not apparent at that moment, and later on it was picked up, and suddenly, suddenly it becomes extremely valuable. Well, that's that's uh, just one. I mean, it's so interesting that there's so much. Room for discussion. Are you? I appreciate uh, that. That's great. Are you committed to the, to the idea of uh, multiplicity of interpretations, it, by definition? Yeah. But is there any way of judging between different interpretations? Is there any way of determining that one set of interpretation is perhaps more plausible, perhaps is closer to the text historically, theologically, sure. and so on? Sure. What are the bases for judging between uh, different interpretations? How do we judge? There is not a definitive you know, set of tools that I can employ and say A to C and that's what we're going to do and then we know better. It is basically open for debate in terms of whatever you, brought, you bring forward that is convincing in the particular case you're talking about. That will be... Convincing to whom? Convincing to your audience. I mean, you're, here's the point. That's what I meant by internal and external tensions. <clears throat> I mean, you're talking close to a community of believers, right? But also at the same time to people who may not, you know, be part of that community of believers, but still find your debates interesting. Yeah, and uh, they might find something convincing, whereas your your own community will not. That is very likely, right? Um, and then if I would set out, like there is that in philosophical theology, I have a way broader sort of toolbox that are applicable than in juridical theology, right? Um, because it's very much defined accordingly, like, you know, I mean, there have been guilds that have been created, so in order to be able to even give, um, a, you know, like a verdict on an issue, you need to have been trained in a specific way, you have to be able to access certain knowledge and support, and then only you get the, um, sort of, you know, the veni and agendi, the authority to speak on behalf of the tradition. Whereas philosophical theology doesn't have these very narrow, a defined set of rules. It is much broader in its understanding, and yet it is the you know I would say the basic limits are the limits of convincing and winning the argument. I mean, if you go back in the past, Canaan, oh boy, I mean that was extremely entertaining because it was you know a parley of arguments and it was satirical. You you know you took down the other person, you made fun of him, you were a populist, and no matter what you did, at the end of the day, if you win the argument, you won the battle, right? So. Um, and, but that has changed, so we, I can't like, come in and uh, sort of take on the canon that has been instated in the 8th century and do it today. It would be quite funny and entertaining, I assume, but it would not convince the community of believers. So is there any difference between rational argument uh, and purely persuasion? I mean, that argument has been made that there are people who believe that there are. What do you mean by rational argument? It's persuasion. It's persuasion is based is on rational arguments. Coherent yeah. And uh, is uh, based on the processes of, of reasoning, which are impe impeccable, perfect fami familiarity with the text. But somehow it doesn't happen to approve the consent of, of the community because you are dealing either with the wrong community or you're in the wrong place and all sorts of different factors. I mean, so many. Philosophers in the Islamic tradition have yeah. suffered because of yeah. the hostility of the audience. They are exposed to the wrong kind of audience. Yeah. So what do you mean? Yeah. Persuasion, unsatisfaction, yeah. and response of the audience, that is... Uh, 
that yeah. is not exactly something yeah. you know, that, that is, intellectually is see, that's the very fruitful. It's the conflicting uh, aspect of the plurality in Islam. That, yeah. you know, on the one hand, it would be so much easier if you have a Catholic church who would say, this is wrong, this is right. Yeah. right? And then you would be, you know where the enemy is, basically. Right? <laughs> but in Islam, it's not that easy. So, um, you know, there is no such thing like enemies. I mean, people will still call them, but no, it doesn't. like any interpretation is. So in the Islamic history, there was a thing, a movement called Murjia, which basically means we postponed the decision. It became mainstream. So people were, you know, arguing and arguing and arguing, and there was no end. So basically, said, you know what? We're going to leave it up to God. Once we're back with Him, with God, we'll have Him decide about this. So it's not definitive, but we can come up with arguments. If one person is, you know, convinced by it, great. If not, also great. So he'll have another set of uh, system he will follow, and everything will be authentic, and everything will be fine, and we will have one day an authentic. I mean, one day we will have a definitive response to our questions. But the important part here is not to lose sight of it. The culture of inquiry exists. You know, it doesn't mean that debates were over. It just meant we won't have a response to every single debate. But debates are appreciated. And what I criticize about the current state of Islamic intellectual or public discourse is it's not enough debate happening, not enough like crossing um, to other fields and engaging with that, because that's what defined Islamic theology for so many centuries, and that is lost. That's a culture that needs to be sort of awakened and reawakened and taken from the margins back into the center of the debate, right? Which means we will have a very, you know, broad understanding of what Islamic, it's good, it's, it's fantastic. And, uh, nothing wrong with it. So, so, if you are committed to, could I just uh, pursue this? Uh, just okay, one, yes. one last question. One last question. I, I'm believing uh, I'm not here to, I'm not an unfounded theory, but I'm not on, here to disrupt the Absolutely proceeding right. at all. Your yes. questions are very welcome. And I belong to a tradition where in this sort of matters I would be given more opportunity for kind of dialogue which might actually be helpful. So uh, the question is that if you are uh, committed to multiplicity of interpretation, then do you think you are cognitively a relativist? No, I tried to actually explain that I, I see the danger of that, that yeah. you end up basically saying that it's all relative, but I, I am taking normative standpoints, right? Um, and when I say doubts should be made accessible into my system of work, it's a very normative standpoint. I'm not, you know, sort of taking it out. I'm very normal in that aspect. Um, that's important. Okay, one last question? Yeah, I think it's actually just maybe a helpful observation, or you may have observed it already, and so I'm just saying, yes, I need you. Um, but it seems like, so when you talk about, about the Abraham story, right, yeah. I was immediately struck, oh, well, Kierkegaard, perfect, right, this would be a perfect match. And then you mentioned Kierkegaard, I was like, yes, but you don't want to talk about Kierkegaard, you want to talk about these other guys. And I, I, I wondered why, and this the answer I came up with while I was thinking about it was, um, this is sort of an end, these guys are sort of an end game, so right? you can demonstrate that, um, that even these philosophers can do something helpful to help theology over the wall, right? Then you can say, well, that's good. There's going to be lots of cases for philosophy to help. Because these guys sure don't seem Absolutely. helpful in front of that. Yeah. So is that I see the stra strategic value in tackling the most uh, you know, sort of antagonistic figures that could be out there with Nietzsche. Um, sort of try, if I can get rid of Nietzsche, I'm like, on the safe side. If I can and not get rid, but if I can actually survive Nietzsche, we put it this way. If I can survive Nietzsche, I can survive almost anything. That's the idea. So I see that point. It was not, but it came up later in my work. I haven't initially thought so strategically about it and said like I'm gonna pick him up because he's the biggest challenge I can possibly deal with. No, I was more struck by the beauty of his narrative and the way and the strength of his argument, but then I saw, yes, some people might think this is a strategic way of tackling it. I see that. Um, and it is not, you know, like on the top of my priority list, but it's there. Okay. Certainly. And it's, of course, provoking and extremely, yeah, it's a challenge. I like the challenge.